can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome friends to another week of the choices we face. I'm Peter Herbeck and I'm here with Ralph Martin. And today we have the privilege of bringing to you one of the, one of the things we most enjoy every year is our experience at the Lift Jesus Higher Rally where we collaborate with our brothers and sisters in Canada and spend a whole day just lifting up Jesus and proclaiming his word. And this particular, this past year, Ralph gave a really a fantastic talk. We'll be taking a look at it today and really part two in another program, but uh, Ralph, I forgot to say hello. Welcome. Okay. Well, I I, I I know that I'm welcome. Here, so uh, th thank you. And yeah. uh, you know. Well, yeah. There we go. And and the the heart of the of the talk really is focusing on some of the key themes from your book, right? Mm -hmm. Church in crisis, and it's such an important time, an important word. Let's just listen to it. We'll sure. come back and discuss it. Sure. Yeah. Well, the theme of the rally this year is a pretty powerful theme. I mean, it's really like boom. <laughs> Our God is a consuming fire. And when I was praying and thinking about this talk, um, I, I thought about all the different images that, that the, the scripture uses for Jesus and for God. And fire is a very, very common theme. You find it in the Old Testament, you find it in the New Testament. And one of the images that's most used by the inspired word of God to describe God is a fire. You know, fire is a very intense image. It's, it's, it's you know, when you think about earth, wind, you know, fire and whatever, sky, you know. Uh, fire is the one that's really got a punch to it. It's really got a bite to it. It has many positive features. You know, it brings light. It brings heat, thanks be to God. It can be a sign of hope and promise when you catch light of a fire in the distance that home is there, safety is there. And there's many, many positive connotations in scripture too, like the tongues of fire at Pentecost. You know, when the Holy Spirit descended in the form of fiery flames over the apostles' heads, that was an outward sign of what was happening to their hearts. Their hearts were being set on fire. So the fire of God's love, the fire of his energy, his passion, inflaming hearts with love, with gratitude, with zeal. Then we also see how the Lord has used fire to purify. And we need purification, don't we? So we need the consuming fire to consume in us what's blocking our response to the Lord. We need the consuming fire of God's love, his holiness to give us pure hearts to take away all the disordered desires in our heart and center them around loving God and loving our neighbor. When Isaiah got the call from the Lord, he felt like he was unworthy. He was a man of unclean lips and he was. So then the Lord sent an angel with a burning fiery coal to purify him. When Jeremiah was given the commission to speak God's word, and this is really quite a commission. Jeremiah, I want you to speak God's word. They're not gonna pay any attention to you, but speak it anyway. <laughs> how's, how, how's that as a, you know, high motivation for the success of your mission? Jeremiah's mission, if it was to be successful, meant that he obeyed and did it, 
even though he knew the word he was speaking would not be heeded. And we have to do that too, don't we? We have to speak a word when the Lord inspires us to, even if we don't see fruit from it. And then we read about the prophet Malachi, like uh, Cardinal Collins mentioned in his opening talk, where the refiner's fire is getting the impurities out of silver and gold. It's coming to the surface as dross. So the fire of God's love in our heart, the fire of the Holy Spirit in our heart is refining our hearts, refining our minds, making them pure, bringing to the surface what's impure. A John of the Cross has an amazing kind of image he uses to describe the process of purification. He talks about when you put a green log on the fire, it starts to turn ugly colors. It turns black and it starts sputtering and it lets off kind of juices and it lets off smells and it, you know, it's just kind of like gets all charred and real ugly and all this stuff is coming out of the, the log. But then at a certain point, the log turns into fire and the log is fire itself. The log is radiating heat and light. And John describes that as the process of our purification, the consuming fire that consumes what's keeping us from full union with God. But then we also hear in 1 Corinthians 3 about a purifying fire that it's good that it, it's there for us, but we should try to avoid it if we can. It says, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. The day of judgment. Because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation of Jesus survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So it's talking about pretty much the fire of, of purgatory, I think. You know, it's talking about, you know, try to get to heaven, but if you don't, praise the Lord for purgatory. There's still purification that can happen for you, but it is purification. And, and there's a pain to the process of purification. So uh, as I always suggested when I'm talking about this, you know, shoot for heaven. If you miss, praise the Lord for purgatory. Don't shoot for purgatory. If you miss, it's hell. But also, fire cannot just purify, not just inflame with love, but fire can judge. When the fire of God is resisted, it puts us in danger of destruction. The destruction of being separated from God because we're not cooperating with the fire. One of the most powerful commands in scripture, both the Old Testament and New Testament is, you must be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. We kind of skip over it, it's so familiar to us, but it's a command, it's a requirement, it's a necessity. You must be holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. The whole purpose for, why which, we, for which we've been created is union with God. But the only way we can be united with God is to undergo the cleansing fire, is to undergo the purifying fire, is to undergo what John of the Cross describes in another text as the living flame of love that's more and more turning us into love as it burns within our soul. So resisting the purifying fire, the consuming fire, is not a good thing to do. It defeats the whole purpose of our creation. It frustrates the whole reason why God created us. It rejects the whole reason why we're alive today. The reason why we're alive today is to become one with God, to continue the process of transformation, of growth, of healing, of deliverance. Many wonderful things happening in the chat stream. People are getting touched by the Lord. People are getting touched by the Lord here. I'm getting touched by the Lord. 
Fire can destroy, can be an instrument of judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah, fire fell from the sky to destroy those who refused to repent and were doing wicked deeds. If we refuse to repent and we're doing wicked deeds, we're in great danger of resisting the consuming fire and having the fire consume us, destroy us. Second Peter chapter three, verses nine to 18. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is forbearing toward you not wishing that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody to be destroyed by the consuming fire, but that everyone should reach repentance. You can't get into the kingdom by proudly marching in. Unless we're willing to humble ourselves and admit our sin and repent, we will not enter the kingdom of God. It's the message of John the Baptist, it's the message of Jesus, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand, the king is at hand. And that's as true today as the day that Jesus first preached it. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. God is so patient, you know, we're always thinking, saying, Lord, I think this would be a good time to judge the world, you know, I think this would be a good time to uh, punish the wicked. And he says, no, 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 not yet, you know, be patient, you know, we want to give everybody maximal chance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of persons ought you not to be? Living lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be kindled and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire. But according to his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth in which the righteousness of God dwells. So anyway, what conclusion should we draw from the fact that the consuming fire could destroy us if we resist it? Peter tells us here, what kind of lives must we not live? What kind of commitment to growing in holiness must we not make? What kind of effort must we not put into being with the Lord and obeying him and desiring him and having him first in our life? Jesus makes this so clear time and time again. Matthew chapter five, he says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say to you, don't welcome lust into your heart. Jesus is saying he, he appreciates us keeping the commandments, but he's going for internal transformation. He's going for completely capturing our hearts so we don't willingly or voluntarily give ourselves to anything in our mind or heart that's not clean and that's not holy. And then he goes on to say, right after he gives us that challenge, that it's not just about not committing adultery, but it's not welcoming lust into our heart. He goes on to say, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better to enter the kingdom missing a hand, missing an eye, than to go down to hell with an intact body. Jesus is saying, get your priorities straight. Do whatever you have to do to get free from serious sin. St. Augustine was a slave to serious sin. He had a mistress, he had a child out of wedlock. By the time he wanted to become a Christian, he couldn't get free. But he said, I'm responsible for having gotten to this point because of a whole series of decisions I made earlier in my life to keep repeating this sin. And now, though, I'm really a slave. And I just have to ask God to have mercy on me. I can't get out by myself. And the Lord in many, many different ways weakened the chains that were holding him and one day the last chain snapped because he paid attention 
to a grace that God gave him. When God gives you a grace to get out of a trap you're in, when God gives you a grace to get out of a bondage you're in, don't mess with it, grab it, run with it, go through the open door, don't look back. You don't wanna be turned into a pillar of salt like Lot's wife. John the Baptist begins his preaching by saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And people began to respond to the message and flock to him. He began to baptize them in the river, Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? We're not supposed to question people's motives generally. We're supposed to kind of take their repentance at face value. But John the Baptist was the greatest of prophets. And I suppose he could really see accurately into people's hearts. And he felt like they were coming for show. They were coming to win favor with the people that they really weren't repenting. May we never do things for show to impress the Lord or to impress others. May our repentance and our prayer always be sincere. And then he says, if you're really repentant, bear the fruit that befits repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. You know, we're, we're tempted sometimes, us Catholics, to say, you know, I'm a Catholic. You know, I believe I belong to the one true church. I, I believe the fullness of the means of salvation subsists within it, yes. But you know what Vatican II says? That's not your own doing. That's the gift that God's given to you. And if you don't respond to that gift in word, deed, and thought, listen to this, not only will you not be saved, but you'll be more severely judged. The gifts that God has given us shouldn't be taken lightly. We need to respond to them a thought, word, and deed. I bet you've never heard that Vatican II says that, but it does. The reason why it says it, you look into the footnote, is because Jesus says it. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to get into the kingdom of God. This is going to be shocking. Not everybody who's baptized is going to get into the kingdom of God. Not everybody who goes to church on Sunday is going to get into the kingdom of God, but only those who do the will of the Father in heaven. That's why we have to be so laser focused on our Father's will, so laser focused on the person of Jesus and his teaching. You know, there's a lot of people today who like Jesus, but there's a lot of people who don't really know the real Jesus because you can't know the real Jesus unless you know what he says about himself and what he does. John the Baptist goes on. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The one who's coming will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Every single one of these themes that John the Baptist is taken up by Jesus. We're used to thinking, well, You know, John the Baptist was the tough guy in the desert. Jesus is the compassionate guy, you know, preaching in the temple. But listen to what Jesus says in almost identical language in those beautiful, so deep, so profound Last Supper discourses. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit He takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. 
abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. There's a unity between the warnings of John the Baptist and the warnings of Jesus. Even in these most precious moments, these last moments he has with his disciples, he's talking about two kinds of fire. He's talking about the love that comes from his heart. The sacred heart of Jesus, abiding in the heart of Jesus, is often symbolized by a flame, a flame of love. But he's talking about those who don't abide, those who don't stay united, those who don't draw their strength, those who don't pray, those who don't meditate on his word are in risk of withering. Sometimes, I know this is, this is risky to say, but sometimes you might meet somebody who you knew at one point was walking with the Lord, but they've turned away and you can almost feel it in them that something in them has died, something in them has withered, something has gone out of them. And you just pray that they repent before they're cut off and thrown into the fire. The fire of hell. That's an image that Jesus himself uses to describe the state of eternal separation from him. Well, Ralph, that is uh, fiery stuff. And before we kind of talk a little bit about it, I just want to mention this book, A Church in Crisis, Pathways Forward. Notice the fire of the church. And, and Ralph touched on some really important things that some are included in this book, and you can get this at our website at renewalministries.net. But the, the whole image of fire, the fire of God's love, the purifying fire of God, and the fire of God's judgment. Yeah. These are things that Jesus spoke about. They're throughout the scriptures and things we should pay attention to. And some of that, all of those things seem to be happening today in some way yeah. in the life of the church, yeah. isn't it, in the world? Well, Peter, I have to tell you, you know, I've, I've known the message of John the Baptist. I've known the message of Jesus for a long, long time. And I've, I've read these texts for a long, long time, but I'm, I'm kind of speechless in a certain way about the directness, the clarity, and the weightiness yeah. of what's being said. I mean, I think people read the scripture and don't don't hear what's being said. I mean, and and this and the church teaches this, and people don't realize it. You know that quote about if you don't live in accordance with your baptism, you know, uh, you're not going to be saved. You're going to be lost, and your judgment's going to be worse. That's in Vatican II, section 14 of the Constitution of the Church. It's right there. And the footnote says, oh, by the way, Jesus says this. But yeah. I think a lot of us Catholics kind of like aren't hearing, aren't listening, because we're not hearing it proclaimed with authority, with power, with conviction. I, th I think we need our priests to say, do you hear what Jesus said here? Do you hear what Jesus says? we got to do something about this. Yeah, and I think that's the... Uh kind of recapturing the prophetic fire that's in Jesus yeah, and in yeah. and John and in yeah. the apostles, yeah. the urgency of it, yeah. you know, the zeal, the zeal for souls. It made me think about, um, I've seen Vincent de Paul said, he used to say that if love is fire, zeal is its flame mm -hmm. and zeal for souls, zeal for God's yeah. purpose, zeal to, to get others to draw people in. And I think there's a kind of a 
status quo in a comfortable culture and yeah. don't want people to be upset and let people kind of have their own journey. And that's not how prophets think. That's just not how the Lord thought. I mean, he brought the truth. He brought clarity and, and it, paying attention to it is everything. Yeah. You know, yeah, every, everything Jesus says is a call to respond, you know, and a lot of times we just throw out, here's food for thought or, yeah. you know, here's meditation or here's some old stories that you might find meaning in. No, yeah. these are old stories that are telling us what we do have to do to save our life. We have to act on them. Yeah, absolutely. And that the uh, that John 15 passage is so key, so key, friends. Jesus is saying, the beginning says, my father's the vine dresser. And the vine dresser cuts off dead wood as well as pruning good stuff. Yeah. And the father's tending all of us who are being are uniting ourselves or not uniting ourselves to the Lord. And sometimes the father literally has to cut off the dead branches for the sake of the branches. Because there's could be people living in the church or people who say they're Catholic, but they're actually dead branches. Yeah. And and they're not awake and the preaching's not helping them wake up yeah. to their situation to bring them to provoke them to repentance and yeah. things. So the Lord has to cut them off yeah. in different ways so that they repent and come back. And so many parables talk about this, the weeds and the wheat. Yeah. There's weeds in the church and there's wheat in the church, you know, and it's going to be separated in the final judgment, but it's already different. People are already living under different rules, following a different gospel right right today in the church. Yeah. And as fiery friends as it is and how challenging as it is, Ralph, it's good news, isn't it? It's about love. It's about the fire of love. Yeah. Wanting to bring everybody into love, but if yeah. you resist love. Yes, exactly. And And God has defined love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not die, but will have everlasting life. Jesus is love. God is love. God revealed himself to the Father fully in his son, Jesus. And he's clear about what love is, and he's clear about what we're made for. And we're made for that love, the love that he defines, not the love the world defines. And so if we don't hear God's word, we're not going to see it and hear it be able to respond to it. So friends, I want to uh, also give you a chance to re receive this new booklet that Ralph wrote, Join the Resistance. A church alive, a zealous church that's resisting the lies of the enemy. You can get this at the 800 number on the screen. Go to our website at renewalministries.net. Also, downloading the Renewal Ministries app will give you access to everything that we're doing. You can listen to all our great programs and all the things God's doing with us at your leisure. But until next week, this is Peter Herbeck and Ralph Martin say, let's receive the fire of God's love and say yes to his purifying fire for our salvation. God bless you. Join the resistance. I'm only talking about resisting one thing, the lies of the devil working through our corrupt culture that are intended to drag us and the whole human race to ruin. There's no way of explaining the radical changes in our culture and even in our church without recognizing the work of the evil one. This booklet identifies some of the main lies we encounter and gives us tools to recognize and resist them. The scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So ground yourself ever more deeply in the personal love of Jesus and the absolute truth of his teaching. Ask him for the courage and wisdom needed. And from that place of trust and confidence, join the resistance.